What happened last Tuesday night on November 8th was a turning point for our nation. I believe God has given us a reprieve, at least of four years. And I'm going to show you in the study this morning some remarkable things out of the Bible that I believe speak prophetically about this hour. We're dealing with a concept called Babylon. Today, Babylon is fallen. In one hour, Babylon falls. Just like the book of Revelation in chapter 18 of Revelation, in one hour, Babylon falls. Now, there's a big debate about who Babylon is. I don't think it's America. Some people say Babylon is America. I don't believe it's that. And I got my own teachings on this. You're going to hear that when we get to that place, okay? But I don't think America is Babylon at all. I believe America has, God has his hand on this nation. And, and uh, we're going to turn to Isaiah 45 later. By the way, there's some interesting things that parallel <laughs> the Word of God. What year are we in now, as of last month? What year of Israel are we in? Five, seven, seven, seven. This is the Jewish calendar now. We don't go by our calendar. The Jewish calendar, the year 5777 started last month. At the new moon, two Jewish priests had to come out in Israel and witness the crest of the moon. And as long as there were two witnesses, then they went to the Sanhedrin and they said, yes, the new year has begun. So as of last month, the year 5777 began in Israel. Is this exciting or what? Isn't it interesting? I don't know if this is coincidence. When, Dan, when Donald Trump is inaugurated in January, it's on his 70th birthday, the seventh month from his birthday, and on the seventh day, Donald Trump is going to be inaugurated on his date of birth, 777. So is his birthday July 7th? I don't know exactly. Yeah, it must be. Yeah, July 7th, it's July 7th, because January 7th, he'll be inaugurated. And, and it's, his, it's his 70th year, the seventh month of his birthday, and the 70th day. This is so exciting. Wow. Or the seventh day. I, I'm just, I'm telling you, we live. Remember in the Old Testament, they looked on days, years, and months. This is a sign. Yes. I believe we have a, what I call a modern day Cyrus. Donald Trump, I believe, is a modern-day Cyrus, and I'm going to be teaching that this morning from, the, from Daniel chapter 5. Cyrus, get this, Cyrus was the king that took Israel out of Babylon captivity. Cyrus was the king that rebuilt the second temple. He restored Israel to Jerusalem, and they built the second temple. I believe Donald Trump is the king that's going to restore the third temple for Israel. Praise God. Is, is that exciting? It is. We live. Now, I, I believe that Donald Trump is under what I call common grace. Common grace is what Winston Churchill was under. George Washington was under. Men who have common grace, watch this. It's not particular grace. It doesn't mean he's a born-again Christian, even though I believe he is. Or that he fits the pattern of a committed Christian. I don't think Donald Trump, I would consider him what I would say a dedicated disciple of Christ. But I believe upon him is something called common grace. Where it's, it's given from heaven to earth to empower a man to change history. So that's what Winston Churchill did. There were certain people in history of the world that changed the, the course of history. And it's interesting to me that Cyrus is found in the 45th chapter of Isaiah. What will Donald Trump be? The what president? 45th president of the United States. There's so many parallels here. I don't know. And then I was watching a thing this morning on the codes of the Bible. And it, it just was too remarkable. I, I'll have to bring that in with the teaching. And you give, me a, you give me your judgment on it. But it actually, when you decode that chapter in Isaiah, it says Donald Trump. 
<laughs> it does. Yeah, the code, the code says that. And I'll, I'll bring you a little short video of that when I do that teaching later on on prophecy here. Uh, I'm telling you, we live in significant times, people. We live in probably one of the most interesting, exciting moments in human history. Now, while we're in Isaiah 45 for just a moment, I want you to turn to Isaiah 45, then we're going to get into Daniel chapter 5, because this all ties together. I believe this whole thing in Isaiah 45 is really Donald Trump. I believe it defines him. It, it says he's going to build a wall, hello, in the city. He's going to rebuild cities. He's going to be a rebuilder of cities. He's going to, and by, by the way, there's going to be great treasure given to Cyrus. Hidden treasures of darkness. You know this, don't you, uh, David? You're on top of this. But read, read verse 11 with me, okay? Isaiah 45, verse 11. All right. Oh, I like this Bible. Ooh, I can actually read this. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and His Maker, ask of me things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, you... Command me, says God. Hello? Can we go over that verse again? What's the name of the verse? Okay, Isaiah 45, verse 11. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and His Maker, ask of me of things to come concerning my sons. Who are the sons? Us. That's us. It's God's, God's kids. Ask of me concerning your sons. And concerning the work of my hands, you command me. Amen. Now look at the next verse. I have made the earth and created man on it. Now what did I prophesy this year? This is going to be the year of man. Yes. This is the year of man. 16, 2016, year of man. Yes. And it's going to also be the year of manifestation. And is also going to be the year of the revelation of the man, Christ Jesus. The man. Because what's, who's the man, Christ Jesus? It's the body of Christ. We are the humanity of Christ. As he is in heaven, so are we in this world. Do you understand the authority God has given us on earth to walk in power? That he even asks us to command him? Concerning things of God? What, is it, what does it mean to command God? It means to take the word yes. and apply the oath. Yes. That's what it means, right? Yeah. Say, God, you said. Mm -hmm. Now, my kids have authority with me when I make a promise to them, right? <laughs> they have authority with me. Yes. My kids, they have memories like elephants. <laughs> I'll forget, but do they forget? Now, of course, God doesn't forget. He's a perfect father. But he tells us his sons that I have given you the earth to possess it and you command me concerning my works. I believe what happened at the election of Donald Trump is the body of Jesus Christ commanded God to bring forth the right president. Yes. I believe it came from earth to heaven. It was, it was a, the Holy Spirit moved in our hearts. My wife and I stayed up till 1, 1 30 in the morning and prayed over every state. I don't know how many people did that. Yeah. We saw the states go back and forth. It was like a spiritual yeah. battle over every state. Pennsylvania, Michigan. I mean, it was just a battle zone on TV. And, and, we, and Marianne and my wife, when she starts praying, all heaven comes down. And, and I'm telling you, she, she just began commanding. She says, I command this state to come under Donald Trump. I go, oh, keep going, baby. Uh, come on. I'll tell you. We were commanding, commanding the blessing of the Lord. And it wasn't the man, it was the divine destiny of our nation that was at stake. God happened to choose Donald Trump, he could have chose Mickey Mouse. Because when God decrees something, it's powerful. And Donald Trump was decreed to be the new king of the world. Very unpopular to be in office in those days. And then Belshazzar came along. Now, Bel Belshazzar is called the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, there's a little debate theological on this, whether he was the grandson and whether the queen that came to him was his wife because she seems to separate herself from his wives and concubines in chapter 5. Most 
theologians believe that the queen was the wife of Nebuchadnezzar. She remained in office as kind of the queen, as women sometimes will, like, like uh, uh, in England. You know, women maintain that ongoingness, and she knew about God. Could have well been a Christian. So for 15 years, Daniel sat in his house and prayed. How many know sometimes things don't always move as quick as you'd like? <laughs> How many know God's in no hurry? First of all, the 70 years of captivity had to be fulfilled, right? And even after Belshazzar fell, there was another king. Uh, he was a Mede, king of, of Medes and Persians. He was Darius. Darius came in and Daniel reigned with Darius as prophet and as man of God for years. See, Daniel reigned through three kingdoms. Nebuchadnezzar, actually Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Darius, and Cyrus. How many know integrity is longevity? Keep saying that around here. If you keep your integrity, you'll live long. Cliff Barrows died yesterday. 93 years old. And I heard his, uh, out on Moody this morning, I, I heard his testimony. What a wonderful man. He told Billy Graham, he said, Billy Graham, you're going to be out of a job in heaven. But he says, you know what? George Beverly Shea and I are, are going to have something because we lead worship. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cute, you know. And Billy Graham said, you know what? I'm praying that I get the voice of George Beverly Shea when I go to heaven. And, and uh, Cliff Barrow said, well, that's a stretch. He said, <laughs> but you know, they're just making light of things. But here's, here's a team. Here's a team that functioned together in integrity. When Billy Graham went to a city you know what you do in the newspaper the next week after the crusade? Publish the budget. Publish the budget of the crusade in the local newspaper. Bought a whole page and reported where all the money went to that came in for that crusade. Is that powerful? Integrity is longevity. So if we maintain integrity, maintain it in our life, what we do will stay. It'll have a legacy. Because Nebuchadnezzar had a legacy yes. through the queen. Now, if God can't get you through dreams, he's going to get you through the writing on the wall. <laughs> and by the way, if you go through the book of Daniel, a lot of sayings we use today came out of the book of Daniel. These are sayings that we use in colloquialism today. The writings on the wall. That came out of Daniel chapter 5. And what's the writing on the wall? So Belshazzar's having this big feast and there's something very interesting in the Hebrew here. I'll go over that in a minute. I'll just tell you what it says. I'm just going to report what it means that your loins are loosed. Can I put it in? He crapped his pants. That's exactly what it means. <laughs> when he saw the hand of God on the wall writing, he literally lost his bowels. It's exactly in the Hebrew. Go study it. You got to be pretty scared as king in front of a thousand of your lords to lose it. That's fright. <laughs> I love the humor, don't you? The Bible just tells it like it is. So when you see that your loins are loosed in the Bible, that's what it means. And he's sitting there and celebrating and drinking wine and bringing in these vessels. Who cares who, that they're holy? Who cares that my dad said that, you know, they belong to the temple of God. We're going to drink out of them and we're going to show that our gods are greater than... It. See, it was a contest between the gods. Because what were the gods they were honoring? Gold, silver, silver and wood. And so what were the vessels they brought out of the temple? Gold, silver, wooden vessels. So they, they're, they're just, he's literally saying, we, we just defy this God that's represented, that, that these ancient Jews practiced over in Jerusalem. We're not going to honor that. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I believe up to this election, that's what America's been doing, is dishonoring that which God has anointed and chosen. 
Times have changed. Cyrus has arrived. So Daniel goes into the king because all the astrologers and the soothsayers and the magicians were all brought in. He's still hanging out with these guys. This was evidently something Chaldeans did for centuries. And he says, what does this writing on the wall mean? They didn't know a thing. And so the queen came in and said, oh, Belshazzar, there is a man who knows the secrets he, and the Spirit of God is in him. Isn't that interesting? The Spirit of God is in this man named Daniel. He will interpret this writing on the wall for you. And so let's read about it. I love it. <laughs> okay, this is an awesome revelation. It's a demonstration of power. It's the hand of God. Ooh. The same hour the fingers of a man's hand appeared and rode opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall in the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Now, you know, there's a, there's a verse in Romans 3.18. You know, one of the, one of the characteristics of a, a society that has relativism, that has no absolutes, is there turns out to be a spirit of no fear of God before their eyes. We do what we want. Nobody's going to hold us to account. Well, get ready. Because last Tuesday night, the handwriting was on the wall. And I got a bunch of videos I put together of the liberals weeping. I just love it, don't you? <laughs> you know, they've been celebrating all these years. It's time to weep. All right, many, many tekel yfarsin. Many means God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wandi. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Now, the Medes and the Persians had already sieged a good part of the city before this happened, but they couldn't get through the moat. And the gates of the city of Babylon were, were famous. The walls were 64 feet wide. That's a pretty good-sized wall. If you're going to penetrate a wall, that's, that's fairly hefty to get through. You're not going to hit it with a battering ram. And there were dual gates in this city that were brass and solid. I mean, they were iron. They were, they were impenetrable. The gates of Babylon are very famous, and you can even see pictures of them on the Internet. But they said, listen, there's a better way to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to, we're going to divert the river, Euphrates River, and it's going to shut off the moat, and the moat's going to dry up. And we're going to walk right in in dry land into the city. Isn't that powerful? And so that's exactly what happened. And so Belshazzar's fear, when he saw this on the wall, I'll tell you, God is bringing a holy fear. I love it, don't you? Yes. The fear of the Lord is a good thing. Do you know that's one of the sevenfold spirit of God? A spirit of the fear of the Lord? If you have a godly fear in your life, that's healthy. Amen? A godly fear is, promotes right standing with God. What is it? Isaiah 11 says, I will put upon him the spirit of wisdom, wisdom and knowledge, counsel and might, knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Was it wisdom and something else? But the sevenfold spirit of God, one of those is the fear of God. And I'm telling you, Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, Belshazzar, when he saw this writing, he went into fear, desperate fear, because he knew something had happened that was going to change everything. Well, that night, that night, Daniel would go down the steps of the king's palace and deliver the decree of the nation to Darius. By the way, it was Daniel, history tells us, Daniel that delivered the authority of the nation Babylon to Darius, the new king of Mede, the Medes and the Persian. Darius ruled for a while and then Cyrus came later. Darius ruled in Babylon for a time, but Babylon still wasn't set free. It just came under a different rulership, which was Darius. It was Cyrus that came and liberated the nation back to Israel. He said, time's up, time to go home, time to restore your nation. They rebuilt the walls. 
I, I don't, I, I'd have to check that. I, don't, I didn't get that in my notes, but Darius reigned for a, a season until the time was fulfilled of the 70 year captivity. And Cyrus came in and said, now Darius, because they worked together, the Medes and the Persians, and, and he said, now we're going to liberate this nation back to its country, back to its place, back to its, its uh, inheritance. And he, he brought the Jews back home. So that's the history line of what happened out of Babylon. And the next empire began, which was the Medes and the Persians. You know what the Medes and the Persians were known for? Trade. Persians were great all the way to India and uh, the Persians brought wealth on the earth. If you think the, the, the nation Babylon was wealthy, you should study the Persian Empire. It was powerful. And Cyrus represents the restoration of the Persian Empire as well as the restoration of Israel. Of wealth on the earth. Are you, am I going too fast on this? You all with me? Okay, so first of all, our Belshazzar's fee. Secondly, Belshazzar's fear. And thirdly, Belshazzar's failure. We know the failure, all right? It was sudden destruction. That very night, the king of the Chaldeans was slain. How many know things can happen quickly? <laughs> things are happening quickly in America. You know why? Because our time is short. Amen? Our time is short. And I believe we have to act now. If we're going to, if we're going to see God complete His purpose, which we will, we need to move with God now. What have I been saying all along? The key to this age is hearing what the Spirit is saying to the church. And if we're tuned in to the kingdom, because there's a transition going on in the church today from denominationalism to kingdom. Even among the Southern Baptists, they're starting to speak kingdom. It's a kingdom age now. Because it's the promise of the end time gospel message. I say it almost every teaching. When this gospel of the what? Kingdom is preached in every nation, every ethnos, dialect. And they say they're going to complete that in four years. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting that the temple is getting to be ready to be built? By the way, Ivanka, is it Ivanka? Is that his daughter? Ivanka? Yeah, she announced yesterday that they're going to move the uh, Jewish embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? And I'm telling you, uh, oh, he is. And she, she thought that was, that was exciting, that Donald Trump is going to encourage the temple, with Israel's help, of course, because they're the ones that make the decision, to move the embassy to Jerusalem. Things are starting to move. Huh, are you ready? Are you ready to grab this thing and run with it? Are you ready for a national revival in America? Yes. Are you ready maybe to go to the, some of the rural communities and help this thing out? Right. Uh, we're, we went down over the weekend, took the time, spent the time, videotaped everything, but I want to be a part of this. I want to support this young man. I saw myself in him, you know, years ago. I saw myself in him from the 70s when I was back in the 60s and 70s. I had energy like that. This guy has so much energy. I thought I had energy. Man alive, he's full of energy and life and here's the Spirit of God and, all, and love. At the end of his message, he says, man, God told him to do this. He said, any, any of you young guys that weigh 170 pounds and are 6'1", he says, come up here. And the young guy came up and he took off a $100 shirt and he put it on that kid. Put the shirt off his back right on him. Then he says, hey, he said, any of you men working in the fields that need new shoes? And he, pardon? Size nine. Oh, size nine. Size nine shoes. And they were like work boots, man. He was tromping the devil. I said, when he put those shoes on before the service, I said, those look like devil tromping shoes. <laughs> but they were going to really greatly bless some worker in the field. And a man came up and he, he took his shoes off on the platform and gave them to that, one of those local workers. I mean, this is a demonstration of a man of heart. Amen. Not out for some big show and blah, blah, blah. This, this man loves people, loves souls. You know him. What's he was your name? professor. Uh, Daniel McGeehee. Oh, yes. Daniel yes. McGeehee. Yes. He's been on, I believe, CTN some with Rodney Howard Brown in the past and that kind of thing. And just get ready. Get ready, folks. Get ready. We're going to see a breakout of national revival in America in the rural community. 
and America is going to be transformed and changed spiritually by the rural people of this great land. Yes. And he can talk a mile a minute in his accent. Oh yeah, he's got he's got a southern accent. Yes. Yes, he does. And uh, I just enjoyed it. I, I it was a, I came home so charged up, didn't you, Carol? We talked all the way home. I'm excited, and I don't know how Kingdom Life University ties into this, but when I get done to this video, I'm going to send it to, to TBN, to CBN, uh, to, to Daystar, to God TV, and I'm going to tell them, listen, catch this next move of America. This, this is what God's doing. This is something coming from the roots up. And God has given us favor, amen? amen. God has given us a season of favor. Well, I'm going to go ahead and find this video real quick and show it to you, okay? We'll close with that today. And this, this I, I enjoyed putting this together. Let me see if I can just get on my, get on my uh, channel here real quick, okay? Do you need prayer for? Well, we always say health. Health is the most important because if you have health, you could keep going, keep fighting. I would say I would like them to pray for guidance and to pray for our country because we need prayer now almost more than we've ever needed it before. And she's going to pray, and I want you to stretch forth your hands. I really want you to intercede on his behalf. Years ago, Years ago, when we first met him and he was considering running for president, there was a great preacher there, I don't want to say his name, but he is nationally known. And he said something to you, I don't know if you remember. He said, I want you to understand, Mr. Trump, that if you choose to run for president, there's going to be a concentrated, satanic attack against you. He said this over, over five years ago, he said that. He said there's going to be a demon, principalities and powers are going to war against you on a level that you've never seen before. And I'm watching this every day. So we're going to pray for you. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that you raise up a man for such a time as this. God, we ask you right now that your choice is this choice. We believe, Lord God, that you ordain things. You said all authority is of you. Now, God, I ask that you would touch this man. Donald J. Trump. Give him the anointing to lead this nation. We thank you, God, that as a room full of clergy, a room full of leaders, a room full of business owners, mothers, wives, husbands, fathers, we ask for help. And we ask you, God, to let that help be in the form of the next president, Mr. Donald J. Trump. We ask you, God, to bless him keep him safe, give him the wisdom and the strength to lead this great nation. In Jesus' name, amen. What I was hearing the Lord say was, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Yes. The Lord was showing me how you, Mr. Trump, Donald, as a young, as a little boy and growing up, that you were a good son. You had a good father. And the Lord is saying, I'm your father. And I have prepared you for this time, for such a time as this. You have been groomed and prepared for this kind of battle. God has given you the backbone and the courage to say yes to this challenge. And I just want to go ahead. I know you want to add to this. No, keep going. Yes. So. Father, I just thank you for this man. And right now, I want to remove all the arrows that have been thrown your way, all the backstabbing, all the curse words, all the things that have been said to you and about you. In the name of Jesus, I remove the effect of those words. I remove the effect of hatred and, and, and what could have been said or done. I remove every threat that has been thrown in your way for you and your family. Lord, I thank you for, for uh, his wife also and his uh, Melania and, and, and his children. What a beautiful family. And Lord, I pray that you surround them like you surround Jerusalem. You surround, you build a wall of fire around their family and around everything that they do, but around their family, Lord, and be the glory in the midst of that, Lord. Lord, I thank you that you have prepared him for such a time as this. Lord, you have your hand on this man, and I thank you for it. 
Lord, I thank you that he's fearless. I thank you that he's fearless and he's courageous. And I thank you for the boldness that you have. Yes, you are bold. And this is this comes from the Lord. This comes from God. He has created you. He has created you in your in your mother's womb. And he has created you for such a time as this. And Lord, I thank you. Lord, we desire to have that kind of boldness <laughs> in the church, in the kingdom of God. Yes, we're, we're called to bring heaven on earth. Earth. And we need the boldness of the Lord to do this, and I thank you that he's able to do that. Now, Mr. Yes. Trump, if you could do If Trump hopes to pull this off, he's going to need one key ingredient and a lot of it. A source inside the Republican National Committee says it would take at least 80% of the evangelical vote to put him in the White House. Is it about the base at this point to make sure evangelicals, who are a big part of the base, that they get out? Because do you believe evangelicals are the ones, they, they kind of brought you to the dance, if you will, and they're the ones that are gonna get you over the top here? Well, we're doing very well with the evangelicals, mm -hmm. and if they vote, we're gonna win the election. I gotta ask you though, and let me just put this in my mind. This is the Jewish Heritage Study Bible. And we have it especially for you and we have it for your wife. Because when things go down, you can study the Word of God. When things seem like it's almost impossible, you'll read Mark 9, 23, if thou canst believe. What is your message to those that are on the fence and aren't sure? I just want the people to remember United States Supreme Court. Whether they love me or like me or don't like me, we're going to put great justices, pro-life justices. We're going to put a Second Amendment justices. And I think for the evangelicals, it's so important that they get out and vote. Trump's wife Melania clearly understands the connection between this voting bloc to her husband's chances at success. We want to thank them to the support of, uh, you know, my husband. Uh, we believe in them. We are standing with them and we will be strong for them.